طيب مساء الخير مرحبا بالجميع آه الى جلسه آه بعد الغداء اللي بتكون عاده صعبه حتى ما استخدم يعني تعبير اخر لوصفها قلت This panel will be devoted to discuss Iran's look east policy, but uh, from the context of the problems with uh, the Arab world, this is something we have, we all have to admit to. The, the best manifestation of that was uh, the morning morning lecture, our keynote speaker spoke about the Chinese and Indians and all other civilizations, but he uh, did not mention the Arab Islamic civilization. Whether by ignorance or sheer design, this indicates a problem in Iran's relations with the Arab world, and we will be talking about to central countries, Iraq, with its ancient civilization, Mesopotamia, from until the Arab Islamic civilization. And we'll be talking about Egypt and the Egyptian-Iranian relations. And we all know that Egypt civilization is also an ancient civilization. It's my pleasure to introduce two well-known speakers today. Dr. Harith Hassan and Dr. Huda Raouf. Dr. Ha Dr. Harith Hassan is a senior non-resident uh, resident in, at the Carnegie Center and he focuses on Iraq uh, policies of identity and he has a PhD from Santa Ana in pizza in Italy uh, and also um, an MA from Leeds University before he joined Carnegie. Uh, he also was a senior uh, fellow at the Europe Council and then Radcliffe uh, Center at Harvard University. Dr. Hart Hassan will be uh, talking about the Iran's East policy and the Chinese alternative and its impact. And also our other speaker, who will be talking about uh, Dr. Huda Raouf. She's assistant professor at the New Al Jazeera University. And uh, she is the head of the Iranian uh, Studies Unit and a member of the uh, Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs and a member of the Economics and Political Science Committee of the Supreme Council of Culture. She contributes to many uh, Arabic newspapers and also appears on many Arab TV channels. I start with Dr. Harith Hassan. He will be talking about, uh, uh, you have 15 minutes, Dr. Hart will talk about uh, the pivot to the East in Iraq and the Iranian influence. Thank you, first of all. In my uh, presentation, I will speak briefly on the, Iran, the, the Iranian influence in Iraq, but I'll focus more on the look east policy and the intersection between the regional aspects and the internal affairs in Iraq aspects. I'll divide my presentation into three parts. First, I'll talk about the Iran-Iraq relations. This is this is becoming a given to say that Iran has a very 
big influence. Some go as far as saying Iran controls and exercises hegemony over Iraq. I'll try to uh, reconstruct the relations between the two s sides and uh, understanding Iran-Iraq's uh, relations, basing it on the nation states as actors and the relations be between them will not benefit us a great deal. This school of realism is good, relatively speaking, to a certain point, but it has to be uh, um, add to that the constructivist school of thought also. We cannot understand Iran, understand Iran as a nation state only, but Iran is also the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran as a nation state, we're talking about a geographical concept. Iran as an Islamic ideology is an ideology which transcends national borders because it's, it's a transnational ideology concept, idea, and it uh, creates uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, an, uh, uh, I'm not an expert in the Iranian affairs, but the the manifestations of Iran's influence in Iraq and the ties between the Iranian regime and some Shiite forces in Iran, this alliance is the channel through which Iran exercises its influence. In other words, the Iraqi forces, which sometimes are portrayed as loyal to Iran, in fact, they are loyal to the project or concept of the Islamic revolution. And uh, this makes some of these forces accept the, and legitimize the authority of the supreme leader in Iran. At the practical session, it's difficult to separate these two aspects, but at least at the level of the relations between the two countries as two distinctly different nation states according to the principles of international law. And the second aspect is the level of partnership, ideological partnership between the ruling regime in Iran and the influential ruling forces in Iraq, which created, the, which made the Iranian regime to start its own organizations like the popular uh, Hashd Shabi, which created its own structures, uh, popular mobilization, Al Hashd Al Shabi, which has become a tool to enforce Iranians, uh, Ira Iranian influence. This is important for us to understand because Iranian influence in Iraq is a manifestation of transnational Shiite uh, ideology that uh, Iranian Iranian regime is the nucleus of it, and Dr. Haider Saeed has used the term that uh, the Shiite nationalism, which is transnational and transborder, and the Iranian regime acts as the nucleus for this ideology. There are other factors, like the two countries being neighbors, Iran being a stable country, and Iraq is, is unstable. This is the first part of my intervention. In the second part, I want to focus on how the idea of looking east policy manifests itself in Iraq and the forces which support it. From the constructed point of view, Iraq now has a shaky uh, national ide geopolitical ideology, has no clear policies, no clear pivots. The idea of Iraq being a democratic country which is allied to the West, which was promoted by pro-American occupation, uh, uh, 
promoted is not there. Iraq is neither democratic nor pro-Western or allied to the West. And at the same time, sometimes the Iranians classifying Iraq as part of the uh, anti anti-occupation uh, front, but no Iraqi government has classified itself as such, but it's uh, closer to the concept of a hybrid regime. We, we, in, in Iraq, we do not have one uh, power center to have clear authority. But this may not last for long. Maybe if one of the forces, say the pro-Iranian force, manages to impose this control, then the situation will change. There was always an attempt to link Iraq with a certain geopolitical and geoeconomic space with Iran. I can refer to what Adel Abdel Mahdi, the former Iraqi prime minister, said, who was one of the most prominent figures behind the Look East policy of Iraq. And he said that Iraq's Look East policy aims at liberating Iraq from international hegemony, i.e. American hegemony. In his letter, they started linking this policy to two things. First of all, and I'm quoting him, the semi-enlightened people who want, who want some Western values which are alien to Iraqi society vis-a-vis uh, -vis others who want to create a new reality which is uh, more uh, in harmony with uh, Iraq's uh, uh, history and the original culture. Of, and what Adel Abdel Mahdi and others see this, the natural uh, belonging of Iraq and where Iraq's uh, uh, allegiances should go. From a pr practical point of view, the East policy of Iraq was linked to the agreement between Iraq and China, which the Adel Abdel Mahdi government signed with China, whereby a fund was to be established and part of Iraq's oil revenues will be allocated to that fund to pay for projects of rebuilding Iraq. This has become part and parcel of the narrative of the pro-Iranian front as a cornerstone of the policy to liberate Iraq from American hegemony. And when in October 2019, uh, protests uh, occurred and led to the collapse of the Adel Abdel Mahdi government. This was accused, this protest movement was accused of being influenced by the United States and aimed at bringing down Iraq's East policy. And after that, there was a struggle between the camp, of, which is close to Iran, which is having increased influence in Iraq, and anti-liberal uh, discourse, which is supported by China and Russia, which tries to establish a position against uh, American liberal values and to call for a more just economic system in the world. The third and final part of my intervention, I'll focus on the economic, practical economic aspects away from the ideological aspects. Iraq's uh, increasing relations with the East is becoming a reality. This is due to the geography and the nature of uh, uh, oil producing country like Iraq. Iraq today is a big and a main market for Iranian products and Iran's way of uh, circumventing the sanctions and uh, the trade between the two countries is almost one-sided. Iran exports and Iraq imports. Uh, 
Iran benefits a great deal from the corruption and the increased power of the militias and the so-called the currency market or illegal currency market. The question in Iraq is today is whether or not Iraq will move towards China economically. The question is whether or not China will have total control of it. 29% of Iraq's oil goes to China. In 2022, Iraq was the third oil exporting country to China after Russia and Saudi Arabia. Now, practically, China is the number one trading partner with Iraq in 2022. The size of trade reached 14 billion. At a time when many countries like Exxon, Mobil, Shell, and British Petroleum is thinking of leaving Iraq, Chinese companies entered strongly into, like PetroChina, CMPC, have big shares in the main fields like Al Ahdab, Western Corner, and other oil fields. In 2021, Iraq appeared to be the number one country benefiting from the Road and Belt Initiative. $10.5 billion was Iraq's share of the. What I want to conclude here is China and Iran are there in Iraq, and relations between Iraq and between them is growing. But talking about look East policy is a political and ideological kind of discourse. If we just talk about the pure economic side, this may be harmful to Iran's market because now Iraq has a share of Iran's uh, exports of oil to China, which uh, because of sanctions are not uh, there anymore. And also the Chinese products are competing with Iran's products in the Iraqi market. And I will conclude here. There are two important considerations here. First of all, the attempt by Iran and the Shiite forces, which are allied to the Islamic uh, uh, revolution, and their power has increased in Iraq to disengage from America or at least benefit from the uh, room for uh, maneuvering resulting from the competition between China and the United States. The second consideration is, as I said, Iraq's system is a hybrid state. It's neither democratic, neither autocratic. The more Iranian forces increase their influence, the more look East policy of Iraq increases because this is becoming part and parcel of the resistance to the so-called the liberal order led by the United States. I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harith. Thank you for uh, staying committed to the time allocated. We would like now to give the floor to Dr. Huda Raouf. Good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. I would like to thank Dr. Mahran for the kind invitation. I know when we talk about relations between Egypt and Iran and calls for rapprochement that are taking place, this is happening within the framework of moving east or what is called the diplomacy of neighborhood, which is a policy that was brought by Ibrahim Raiz. This is part of the policy of Iran and which includes, as it was underlined by all speakers, uh, this is not something that is going to include only Asia, but also neighboring countries such as uh, Arab countries or GCC countries or countries such as Egypt. Uh, so as part of this endeavor, uh, which was uh, given a kind of an impetus uh, by the Saudi Arabian-Iranian agreement and 
also the reconciliation between the two countries. This had given a push to all the endeavor and it has given it a lot of confidence as well. And within this framework, uh, this was an opportunity for Iran perhaps to enhance relations with some countries uh, that uh, uh, were not uh, very close. So this was an opportunity to enhance these countries with countries such as Egypt. Uh, for Egypt, or for Iran in actual fact, this was an opportunity to move forward uh, with such a strategy. I do not want to go into the details of the relationship between Egypt and Iran, but in general, the relationship between the two countries have a number of attributes or traits. There are a number of traits uh, that prevailed uh, for a period of time, starting from the Shah era, from the royal era, whether in Egypt or in uh, uh, Iran. So after Egypt became a republic, there have been a number of parameters that have started impacting the relationship between the two countries. If we look uh, at the relationship between the two countries, we'll see periods of tension, periods of good relationships, and then periods of tension again. And if we try to analyze these periods of times, we'll find that there are a number of parameters that used to impact such relationships. So we have the particularity of international system or order. So two countries were impacted by the Cold War, the competitiveness that prevailed after that, the presence of the U.S. in the region, and we are aware that the region has a number of extra regional actors such as the U.S. and other international actors that intervene in the dynamics and regional relations, and therefore this impacted relations between both Egypt and Iran. Any relationship with an international ally would have its repercussions on such a relationship. So at some point in time, both Britain, sorry, both uh, Egypt and Iran, when they had their common ally, the U, uh, Britain, so the relationship flourished, especially, especially after the uh, relationship that reached the point where a princess was married to the king of Egypt, an Iranian princess, and uh, so on and so forth. So the relationship between the two countries varied depending on the circumstances that prevailed on the ground. When relationships flourished uh, with the Soviet Union, this positively impacted the relationship between the two countries. Uh, there is another factor, uh, and uh, which is also the uh, environment in the region and also the internal developments taking place in each country. So the internal affairs of Iran and the internal affairs of Egypt, both of them impacted in a way or another the relationship between the two countries. So there were priorities. There was a phase where there was regional competitiveness and some other periods of time when the relationships enhanced. So the internal matters could not be excluded from this dynamic. If we talk about recent years, particularly uh, after 2011 and the changes that have manifested in the region, in my view, we have seen a number of traits uh, that have been seen between the two countries. So we have noticed that both countries started avoiding any clashes uh, between themselves. Uh, yes, there was uh, an attempt by both countries to avoid uh, any conflict, any clashes between themselves. And there are a number of regional dossiers that are uh, not points of agreement, but also an attempt not to avoid, uh, in order to avoid 
any clash. And there were a number of reservations by Egypt vis-à-vis -vis some of the dossiers. The parameters of the Egyptian foreign policy are very clear, and this were very clear when uh, Egypt expressed its reaction vis-à-vis uh, -vis the agreement between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Egypt said that it is following the developments that are taking place between the two countries and that Egypt wishes that such relationship would lead to an alleviation of tension in the region. So Egypt was closely monitoring the developments that were taking place in order to reinforce uh, safety, security, and stability in the country to uh, respect uh, the sovereignty of states in order to consolidate ideas of good neighborhood. So these were the traits of the relationship starting from 2011. So when we try to analyze uh, the foreign policy of a state or the relationship between Egypt or, and Iran, there are uh, questions that are posed, and these questions are more than the answers that are provided, uh, particularly that we have seen many, many statements uh, expressed by different Iranian officials, uh, and all these statements were moving towards the regaining of diplomatic relationships with Egypt, uh, but none of this had happened. Yes, there are many questions, uh, and uh, the one of the questions, does Cairo really want to enhance relations? Why uh, Cairo is moving very slowly in this direction? And if there are indicators being sent by Iran that show that the relationship uh, between both countries is uh, moving towards the right direction, there is a question that I always pose. Why there are always questions and statements saying that uh, the relationship relationship between the two countries are about to enhance from the Iranian side, and we do not find similar kinds of statements from the Egyptian side. So what are the gains that are expected to happen uh, if uh, this uh, uh, is uh, achieved. Uh, yes, we understand uh, the gains, uh, expected gains for Iran uh, uh, internally, regionally, and internationally. But what about the gains that are going to be made by countries such as Egypt? What would encourage countries such as Egypt to regain complete uh, relations with Iran? What can be the interest of Egypt in such a move. Uh, so throughout the last 40 years or even more, we find uh, that there was a kind of a direction that was undertaken by Egypt. So what would push Egypt to change such a pathway if the relationship becomes better? So what are the dossiers that are going to be tackled and discussed between the two countries? Uh, yes, there are certain contradictions, yes. Uh, despite the fact that geographically speaking, there are uh, there is uh, a big distance between the two countries, but there are so many common dossiers between the two countries. Uh, yes, uh, so many common dossiers in Africa, in the GCC, in the Middle East, and despite that, the relationship did not go any further. So in light of the calls that have been made by Iran for rapprochement, but we have not seen any response from the Egyptian side, uh, with the exception of uh, a decision that was undertaken by the Ministry of Tourism, such as uh, uh, facilitating uh, uh, having a visa to uh, south of Sinai. So. Uh, the position of Egypt vis-à-vis -vis the rapprochement caused by Iran, these uh, uh, steps are very uh, slow, very limited, uh, and uh, it is limited to very limited realms, uh, such as tourism. Although there are so many dossiers that need to be discussed uh, and tackled by the two countries, does it mean that there are challenges that stand in the way 
way of the relationship between the two countries, especially that we see that there is a lot of detente witnessed in the region, particularly in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Many people predicted that after this relationship, new relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that perhaps Egypt is going to be next. But this did not happen. So what are the impediments? What does make? Uh, what is the thing that makes Egypt not go ahead uh, in said direction? So, despite everything, so many uh, issues have happened in the region. But many countries in the region have reformulated their relationships with Iran. So there are a number of challenges. Uh, and here I'm talking about the relationship between Iran and Egypt. Uh, there are also many, many questions as well. So is Egypt uh, waiting for a change in behavior by Iran in uh, areas such as Syria? We know the policy of Iran in countries such as Syria. So Egypt is very much keen to see stability in some of those regions. And in my view, since 2011 till date, all relations are being reformulated very quickly on the basis of interest, but these relationships do not continue for a long period of time. Yes, there is detente, but there are fluctuations. There is a lack of stability. Stability does not go along for a long period of time. So there are many, many other questions. So in light of the normalization between Syria and many Arab countries and the return of Syria to the Arab League, do you think that Iran is going to allow the regaining of power by many Arab countries in the region, particularly in spaces that have been controlled by Iran. So the question again, is Iran ready for a stronger role by some of the Arab countries in the areas where Iran is having a relationship with the, the countries in those regions, uh, such as Syria and so on. In my view, there, are, ha, there have been many impediments, many obstacles uh, that have been there throughout the last 40 years. Some of those obstacles uh, have been removed, but uh, now the detente is not a complete detente, uh, and the policy of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the situation that we witness, which is the detente in the region, I think the policy of Egypt is very, very cautious. And perhaps from the Egyptian perspective, uh, Iran should take a number of confidence-building measures, particularly when it comes to the dossiers that touch the interest of Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Huda, for your intervention. So we'd like to open the floor for the uh, ladies and gentlemen present with us to pose their questions. We kindly ask you to pose concise and brief questions. Thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا اسمي بارام سينكايا لدي سؤال لكلا المتحدثين. So how does Egypt approach Iraq where Iranian influence is very high, as Mr. Harris highlighted? Uh, so uh, I am especially questioning the Egyptian agenda to, towards Iraq, Iraq. So how does Egypt approach Iraq? My second question for Ms. Uh, Harris Hassan, Mr. Harris Hassan, I am sorry, uh, about the reactions, so you uh, 
uh, focused on Iran-Iraq relations, but what about the reactions of other regional countries? Uh, from Saudi Arabia to Egypt to Turkey. So do you anticipate that a Shiite takeover, pro-Iranian ta forces may take over the power in Baghdad? So does it lead another civil war in Iraq or may end with disintegration of Iraq? Thank you. Shukran jazeelan. Tfaddal. Thank you so much. Uh, two interesting interventions I really enjoyed. My first question on, on Iraq. Uh, uh, it seems that there is a debate in Iraq on the situation of foreign policy. I have been several times to Iraq, and there is this notion of uh, Iraq as a, a Swiss of Middle East uh, being a connecting point, uh, bridge between uh, uh, US and Iran and so forth. So I think, uh, first of all, the question is how dy dynamic are these debates? And the second is you limited the issue of uh, Iraq towards, uh, uh, tilt towards east to the pro-Iranian elites, but I see it as a genuine Iraqi uh, independent position to diversify Iraqi's uh, foreign policy uh, spaces. Uh, I appreciate your response. Now on, on Egypt, uh, first of all, you refer to the internal, uh, let's say, uh, space, along with the regional and uh, 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 international factors, which was very interesting. Uh, my question relates to the internal dynamism of Egypt and Iran. What are debates on, uh, let's say, Riafruchon on Iran, where this uh, diversity stands uh, relates to this issue? The second question is uh, Egyptian foreign policy from the long distance that I follow is showing uh, a more independent position. Uh, uh, it is not just uh, uh, very imp uh, impacted by uh, the Western position, uh, as you mentioned, the issue of Syria. Uh, in the, this regard, uh, where is the debate on China, Asia, and uh, the need for Egypt to also be looking towards to the East? Thank you. I would like to thank the professors for their valuable lectures. My question to Dr. Huda. So amongst the parameters of uh, the Egyptian policy, it depends on the position of those countries vis-a-vis -vis the dam. So my question, as you have said in your presentation, there are attempts uh, by Iran in order to normalize relations with Egypt, but there are no positive responses from Egypt. If uh, Iran uh, supports the position of Egypt when it comes to the dam, would this lead uh, to enhancing relations uh, with Egypt? Thank you very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, my question is to Dr. Harith, uh, taking into account what you have presented, talking about uh, Iran's look east uh, policy is a political uh, uh, move. So don't you think that moving eastward, particularly towards China, is uh, a logical kind of move, particularly that countries in the region, they need development. Such projects are presented by China in a gold plate. Thank you. 
I would like to thank the speakers. My question is to Dr. Huda Raouf. When you talked about the position of Egypt, uh, and uh, you said that the Western position is impactful in uh, explaining the attempts made by Iran. And in foreseeing the future, you mentioned the position of Iran vis-a-vis -vis the different Arab countries' dossiers and how would uh, perhaps make us know what pathway would be undertaken in the relationship between the two countries. As these two reasons, are they separate? And if they are separate, uh, which one is more important? Uh, or do you think uh, that Egypt uh, is uh, looking forward uh, to a position by Iran that is going to be closer to the position of the West vis-a-vis -vis the dossiers you mentioned? To what extent the position of Iran vis-a-vis -vis Arab Moses is going, uh, going to be expressive of the interests of the Arab countries? Uh, First of all, I would like to thank you for the presentation. My question is to Dr. Harith. Some countries that have used, uh, moved uh, west, uh, they have paid a dear price. There is a kind of new colonialism on their grounds. Is there a similar kind of threat, colonial threat, if it moves uh, uh, eastward, countries such as uh, Iraq, uh, for instance, or Iran? So I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Huda to start. With regard to the question about the Egyptian agenda vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, the relationship between Egypt and Iraq is very strong. In recent years, after Sisi came to power, we found that there was a great deal of cooperation between Iraq, Jordan, and Egypt, and there have been economic prospects between the three countries. There have been uh, cooperation between the three countries, despite the presence of Iran in Iraq. But to some extent, Egypt is amongst the countries that support uh, Iraq uh, and uh, wants uh, to continue with the relationship with Iraq. Uh, so uh, Iraq, as it had been expressed by many prime ministers of Iraq, uh, does not want to be only associated with one party in the region. So it was Iraq that hosted dialogue between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And there were also talks uh, that uh, Iraq with Oman uh, have uh, supported the dialogue. Uh, uh, between Egypt and Iran, and consequently, the relationship between Iraq and uh, Egypt is a strong relationship. Uh, but uh, are the interests of Iran in both Iraq uh, and uh, Syria, is this going to allow the Arab countries uh, to have uh, uh, in their interests uh, uh, kept and preserved in those countries. So perhaps this is one of the challenges. I do apologize. With regard to the second question, so when I couldn't get the idea when you talked about internal matters, but when it comes to the other question that was posed and the importance of China and Asia while moving east. So at some point in time, particularly after 2013, after the June revolution, so Egypt resorted to the diversification of relations militarily and politically. That is why 
Egypt is keen to enhance relations and develop them with China. And also, it uh, uh, understands the importance of the BRICS invitation that was made uh, to Egypt uh, when it comes uh, to the Renaissance Dam. So uh, Iran has come back again to uh, uh, in reinforce uh, its foreign policy in Africa, and there are a number of indicators to that, uh, including the visit by Raisi to a number of African countries. So the question to be posed, is this going to make the relationship better with Egypt? Uh, it depends uh, as to how such relationships are going to manifest. Uh, is it going to clash with the interests of Egypt or not? Uh, when it comes to the Arab interests, uh, uh, Egypt plays a historic and historical role in the region, in the Arab region. And there are a number of parameters that rule the relationships and also the foreign policy of Egypt, particularly after 2011, after we have see what we have seen and the disintegration of a number of countries in the region. So Egypt is keen to uh, preserve the central states uh, in the region, not to destabilize uh, the countries in the Arab region, because if one country is destabilized, this is going to be inimical to the interests uh, of Egypt itself. This is not being partial to the interests of the West, no. It is being partial to the interests of Egypt itself, despite the fact uh, that Egypt and and Iran are geographically far away from each other, but there are a number of circles uh, where we see an interplay of both countries uh, in those uh, dossiers, and this is not being partial to any international positions. So it is very useful before we give the floor to Dr. Harith. Uh, so the Iran look east policy, so this is a policy that is still being discussed. Uh, there are discussions in Iran about the feasibility of such a move. There is a group in Iran that still thinks that the interests of Iran lie westward and not eastward. So the scholars specialized in Iran uh, know that uh, Rouhani and Zarif's uh, uh, administrations have put uh, have been put, uh, accused of putting their eggs all their eggs in the Western basket, uh, and even when the strategic agreement was signed between Iran and China, that has been. A lot of criticism, some have criticized Iran of selling itself to the hegemony of China. So such discussion is still vivid inside Iran itself. So uh, there is an elite uh, which is uh, still uh, attached uh, to the West. Uh, there are some analyses that say that Iran, yes, is looking east or moving east, but still looking west. Uh, because for Iran, it is very important indeed for a sanctions to be lifted because in the presence of such sanctions, moving east is not going to be useful. Even China does not... Uh, invest uh, in uh, Iran because it fears uh, secondary sanctions. Uh, so this is a matter that is still subject to discussion because they feel the relationships of Iran regionally and internationally. With regard to the first question, with the current balance of power in Iraq, I don't think there is uh, any regional power that could contest Iranian influence in Iraq, uh, simply because Iran is the only neighboring country that has a veto inside Iraq on the decision making in Iraq, whether through the state uh, official uh, alliances that back the government, the, the, the current government, for example, is based on a majority that is of parties that either uh, allied with Iran or friendly to Iran, 
or by non uh, form, informal uh, tools such as the armed groups. That doesn't mean that there are no other regional powers who are active in Iraq. Iraq today has uh, good relations. I mean, there are problems, but in general, there is a good relations with Turkey. Saudi Arabia is, uh, is in, uh, Saudi, Saudi relations with Iraq is improving. But I think today, most of these uh, countries accepted the fact that Iranian influence in Iraq is so strong, so deep, that cannot be contested. Therefore, they prefer to, to go along with it, to, to be realistic about that. Uh, regarding a question of Dr. Uh, Sajapur uh, about the debate uh, concerning Iraq's role as a mediator between Iran and uh, the US. Yes, most of the Iraqi governments uh, always, uh, like, uh, their talking point is, uh, point is about uh, Iraq doesn't want to be part of any axis. Iraq wants to be a bridge. And they play this role sometimes in some, uh, in some occasions. But in general, I think uh, this role is dictated by the fact that Iraq cannot afford uh, antagonizing Iran or antagonizing the United States. Iraq doesn't have the ability to take uh, to, to be an actor, to play the role of the actorship that Iran is playing today. Therefore, the, the safest role that they could choose is to be a, a mediator. Like even, even, even here, uh, when Iraq, for example, mediated between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, it was less a mediation than providing a place for a meeting. Because Iraq cannot play a role of a guarantor Therefore, when the two countries decided to announce their agreement to restore their diplomatic relations, they went to China. China seemed more active, more able to somehow, to some degree, guarantee this agreement. Iraq doesn't have this ability. It's more like providing a space, probably uh, delivering messages. Uh, and even here, because of the nature of the Iraqi political class and the multiple centers of power. I don't think the Iranians trust so much the Iraqis as, as messengers. Uh, and I agree with you. Of course, Iraq needs to diversify its relations, its, 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 uh, its national interest. The problem here, as I don't know if I was successful in communicating, is that is the discourse that is uh, framing this diversification of relationship. China is there in Iraq. Iran is strongly there in Iraq. You don't need to say, I will pivot to the East, unless in the subtext, subtext in, the, in, the, in the discourse, there's, there are other, other uh, uh, interests. Uh, especially that discourse is used uh, to highlight the fact that Iraq should pivot away from the US. And therefore, it implies the, the need to uh, enter a new axis, which is the eastern axis. بخصوص سؤالك تقريبا هو يعني يلامس السؤال السابق المشكلة. To the previous question, as I said previously, Iraq has strong relations with China and strong relations with Iran. The problem lies in the discourse. What's the purpose behind this caucus and purpose and uh, discourse? What is why we should use this look east discourse. I think the idea is to to weaken Iraq's relations with the West in favor of the East. And this can include an ideological vision and a political interest, an interest to strengthen the, those who are in power in Iraq now. It's no secret that relations with China for these uh, groups does not carry a strong price when it comes to respecting human rights and combating corruption and others. So uh, even lessening the relations with the United States will liberate these uh, groups to do what they like away from American influence. Is there a colonial risk in for me, this is a difficult question to answer. 
I think when we this uh, approach uh, uh, becomes, uh, for example, if you want to liberate yourself from Western hegemony only to facilitate an Eastern hegemony, so you are uh, colonialism is ended and over, but maybe what you're doing here is just uh, that. This is a complex question. Thank you, Dr. Harad. I had two questions through the social media, but they were responded to at the end of this session. I thank Dr. Huda and Dr. Harith for their valuable contributions, and I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have a break of 15 minutes. We will resume for the final panel of today. Thank you.